It's Zach Eady with the Purdue men's basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands. I'm going to be hosting today. I'm Joe Jackson, joined by Craig Bowers, as always. Um, after the Purdue-Arkansas exhibition game, Arkansas gets the win 81-77 to in an overtime exhibition game. Uh, that I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm not uh, up to date on my exhibition histories, but uh, that's got to be one of the better exhibition games in, in a long time, I would assume. The Shout out to Arkansas. The crowd was electric. Like, it, it really – the Broadcasters mentioned it a couple of times, but like it really did feel like a February or March type game just based on the atmosphere uh, and not an October 28th game. So uh, we'll go through kind of everything we saw. Obviously, it's an exhibition and at the end of the day, it doesn't mean everything, but I still think there are plenty of things to take away from this game. Uh, Craig, we can throw it to you just first. Just what are kind of a couple of your overall thoughts on the game? Well, I mean, first of all, before we really get into the game, I just want to say just how awesome it, it was to have this in October. Like we're, we're not even into November yet. And Purdue agrees to go down to Arkansas for an exhibition game. It was for a charitable cause for, um, to help with tornado victims and, and provide some money for them in Arkansas. And to get that level of a game in October and for it to be able to be televised for fans to be able to be there in what is a true road game like let, let's understand um you know if michigan state stays ranked in the top 10 we will have a true road game at a top 10 team but outside of that th this is the only true road game at a top 15 type team that this team's probably going to have all year and it's in the first game of the year with three players who you know are trying to get worked into the offense and defense for the very first time um, there was actually a line on this game. I, I couldn't like they, they, they had a line, uh, to be able to bet on this game. And Arkansas was actually favored by three and a half, which isn't surprising when you have two teams ranked in the top 15 and you go on the road, generally the home team is going to be favored by a little bit. So I, I just, I mean, I, I got chills being able to watch uh, basketball at that level shot making at that level during certain parts of the game, uh, in the end of October, more than anything. I, it was just fantastic to be able to watch. Yeah, it was a great way to just kick off college basketball being back. Obviously, Purdue fans, not the result that everybody wanted, but just the high level intensity, like you could tell that it meant something to everybody on the courts. Um, and, and yeah, that's just that's wild to say about an October game. Um, I mean, so. Mus Musselman went like Fran Con seven or eight a couple of times um, yeah. going after the refs. So it, yeah, it it I mean, clearly it clearly meant something to them. Whoever was on Arkansas, I mean, he blocks lawyer, kind of stares him down a bit while standing over. You had the little bit of a scuffle when Edie and um, is that Davis? Edie and Davis like kind of collided, and they were on the yeah. floor. Um, you had like a little bit of a like mini scuffle there. So it meant something, and that's just good. That's going to be good experience, and I think that's kind of the first thing I think we should hit on is just. What does having this type of game mean? Um, this was like we've already mentioned, like a high level game. It was, you know, uh, top two, top 15 teams. I do want, oh, I do want to correct you really quick, Craig. And maybe I'm like 99.99% sure we do not play at Michigan State this year. Um, oh, you're right. So I, for I forgot about that. Yeah. So yeah. this probably our only true road game against the top 15 team all year, unless somebody in the Big Ten magically comes up into the top 15 besides yeah, exactly. Michigan State. 
and that's going to that's going to be big coming you know just being able to rely on that experience right away and now we'll get into an easier exhibition game and then you have a couple bye games we all know maui's right around the corner um but I, do you have do you have, oh you go no i was gonna say i do know maui's right around the corner because I, exactly. I just realized how quick it was coming up and and the preparation i still need to do to be ready to go to that so yeah fair so um yeah it just Good experience overall. A lot of these young guys, I think, will one of my major points, and maybe we can just go back and forth on major points, um, mm -hmm. is so, okay, I'm going to preface this with it's an exhibition game, and I'm going to say the first half, I think Painter was trying stuff. That second half in overtime, Painter was trying to win. He was coaching to win. Yep. He was coaching like it was, you know, middle of the Big Ten season, 100%. Um, as of right now, and I think we probably should have seen this a little bit. It's just like, it's not natural for new players to immediately jump into the rotation. This team's not as deep as we were kind of hoping it could get there. Um, but right now it's probably, it, it wouldn't shock me if it's closer to seven, eight um, man rotation, even like Maui, just based on who painter trusts when it really comes down to it. Obviously the buy games, things like that, you're really going to work everybody in, but you know, Colvin, let's see. I have the minutes up. Colvin had five minutes. Waddell had four minutes. Those both of them just seem like, they just need more time. Um, first struggled. He had he still played 13 minutes. Obviously, he's going to be more part of the rotation. But then you had one, two, three, four, five, six. You had seven guys play 20 plus minutes. Um, the starting five, and then Gillis and Morton off the bench. So right now, like it, it's going to be interesting to see that develop. But I don't think Painter trusts nine or ten. Probably like if this was a Big Ten game next week, I don't think Painter trusts nine or ten guys yet. Yeah, and I mean, I think the big thing is right now, right? Yeah, um, that, I, I hope I threw that out there enough. Like right now, yeah. nothing can't get there. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly time as, as they get to play some bye games. And, and then we go to Maui and hopefully play three really good teams in a row. And you might see that rotation shorten up again. But I think especially by the time we get to January, then, then I think maybe we see a chance. I, I actually thought Cam got in. Cam did get back in in the second half there a, a few times and did some things defensively um, where I, I could see him maybe getting a little bit more trust a little bit faster. Um, yeah, he seemed like some, that first guy out of that group. Yeah, and it, yeah, in terms of the next group and, and what what you're saying. So I'm, I guess I'm with you. Like, are we as gonna rotate 11 guys like we kind of talked about during certain points in times of the offseason um i don't think we're going to right now if we play a top 15 team on the road and we're actually trying to win <laughs> yeah um but you know i i still think long term there's chances because even what we'll, we'll get into it um but like Col colvin did some really good things in the short amount of time that he had out there so he also had some things that we, we can talk about that weren't so great. Um, but like if he cleans those up, there's things that he can do that just nobody else on this team can do. Um, we didn't get to see a lot of that today. We got to see it once. Um, but we've seen it in, in, in other settings or arenas, I guess I would say. Yeah. And maybe we can start with kind of that group, um, with kind of, kind of clump Colvin Waddell, um, Hi we'll, we'll do that. Colvin Waddell, Heidi, um, three of the guys that, you know, obviously Waddell played a few minutes last year, Colvin and Heidi are freshmen of varying varieties. Um, what did you see from them that you liked and what were some things that you were like, okay, this is probably why they might not get as much playing time right away. Yeah. Um, so I guess, well, one, I, I think, um, you know, you you saw just in a really short window what Colvin can do. Colvin can take two, three dribbles, rise up, and hit over anybody. Um, and he can get that shot whenever he wants it. And that was the only time he got a shot up. That was the only time he was a focal point of the offense. And I think he just ended up with the ball and decided he was going to shoot it. Um, and the other thing that he did really well is play good one-on-one -on -one defense. When uh, he got matched up against an Arkansas guy that was trying to take it to the to the rim. And I don't know if he actually got credited with two blocks. I saw him get his hand on on two balls. I don't know how many ended up getting credited with. Um, uh, Waddell or Colvin, I'm sorry. Col I mean, uh, Colvin. idea or Colvin. 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 He had one block. Yeah, I think he actually had another one. Maybe he just altered it. But to me, it looked like it, and it was kind of back to back. It was within a couple of plays. Um, he does that really well. 
he's still got to figure out. And, you know, we've had Rafael Davis on the show multiple times, and he talks about the hardest thing to do at Purdue under Painter's system is to get in there and figure out your defensive rotations and where you're supposed to be. Um, and then it's also just hard, just offensively, with, within their schemes and what they're doing. You know, if, if one thing shows, then they may go one way or another way, whatever. Um, and, and there were some times, both offensively and defensively, that you could tell, like, he was out of position. Um, he yeah. got caught, he got caught, not rotating over in Arkansas, got an alley-oop off that. And there was another play one or two, right. Either before that or after that same kind of thing. He just got caught out of rotation. And then there was an offensive play where he kind of runs into another guy up at the top. Um, and they're looking at each other like, Hey, you're not supposed to be here. Um, but he's a freshman, right. Who played with team USA, uh, for a large part of the summer. So that's not unexpected at all. And I keep bringing up, but like, also let's not forget how terrible Carson was defensively his freshman year at the beginning of that year. So all that to say, you know, that can change if he figures out, and I think it's going to be vital. Um, it's going to be vital for Colvin to figure that out and be able to get to his defensive rotations and, and be in the right spot at all times, because what he can do in terms of a 15, 18 foot pull up, um, we just don't have a lot of guys on this team that can do it. And we saw in the first half, we were exactly what we were when we lost to FDU. We were poster three, and we were dying by it. And in the second half, some guys started attacking the rim a little bit more. Some guys started getting to mid-range pull-ups. Um, and even if they miss, good things happened off of that because of our offensive rebounding advantage. So that I think Colton's going to be really, really vital from that aspect. The other thing I would say, and then I'll let you go, um, Cam had the one nice drive and dunk. He had two putback chances too. Uh, maybe one was a putback and one was a, off of a pass and a short shot that he just missed. Look, looked like a guy that was playing in his first big time environment. Seems crazy to say about an exhibition game, but the, but that's probably one of the top five environments they're going to play in all year long. Um, in terms of intimidating, just looked like a guy that was in that space for the first time and, and kind of shorted a couple of three, four footers, you know. Um, but he did some good things defensively and painter subbed him in at some point in the second half where he was looking to find a guy that could get, get a stop against some athleticism. And I think that's when we got our shot clock violation against him was, was right after he came in. If I remember, if not, I, like they, they, I'll let you know tomorrow. If, yeah, if, if not, they took a terrible shot right after that. Um, but I think especially when we're playing teams with longer wings with athleticism, um, that as Heidi finds his role in this team, that he could be really, really important for us on the defensive end, especially. Yeah, you had a, a lot of good stuff in there. I think what I want to go with is the shot creation type stuff. Um, Lance wasn't good, two for 11, one for five, in terms of pure just shot making. There was the ability that he had to just, at times, um, you know, Arkansas was like weak. It's called weaking or um, we, they, yeah, they were weaking a lot of screens. And what that is, is you force the ball handler to the weak hands and you basically let, don't let them use the screen. A lot of times Purdue will kind of have that and they'll just kind of get through it because it's part of their set. Uh, Jones two or three times just took it. Like he just went straight to the rim. He didn't convert, but just having that ability, I think the other thing that really stood out is just how like all off season, we're talking about all these newcomers. TKR is going to take a big jump. And I think deservedly so, like all that should have been talked about. Um, Braden and Fletcher are the two most important players on this team besides for Edie. And I'm very, very, I, it reminded me of that. And I'm very, very confident in that again. Like, I think ultimately Edie's going to do what he does. He struggled a bit today, whatever. I, I don't, not worried about that. I know Braden struggled down the stretch with, he forced a few more turnovers. That first half, Purdue was, really bad with him off the floor like really bad with him off the floor nobody could create the offense looked all out of sorts second half fletch really came alive two for six from three you know i was maybe you're hoping for three from six just from a pure percentage standpoint he got to the rim a few times he got in the paint a few times he created he had two assists that go along with it like those were the two guys that could actually create something consistently and like there's still things to improve Braden obviously forced a little bit um but Fletch looked good to me. Like, I know he didn't miss, he missed a couple shots and um, things like that. But like, I was like, oh yeah, like this is the sophomore backcourt duo that could be one of the better ones in the entire country. 
and not that they weren't talked about because they definitely were of what can they do but it seemed like it, they were a little bit glossed over and it just reminded me like yeah like these were the guys they created now like you said colvin and he had that one really good pull up if he can be somebody that um, more just off ball defensively gets it together then he can get more minutes then can be that guy that can create in kind of the pinch um because the bench the bench lineup where it was like jones it was jones heidi morton and then probably gills and tkr um the offense was just out of whack. Like they couldn't really get into anything and it just seemed like nobody could create a shot. So um, hopefully brain's knees all good. He didn't know he played. So it's, I assume it's all fine. Um, but yeah, that was the big thing for me. It's just brain and Fletcher are going to just, they're so important to this team, just everything that they can do. And it, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot on them. I think this year too, especially as some of these other guys develop. So um, we can go, I do have the stats here can throw them up uh you know Purdue 77 Arkansas 81 Fletch and Edie both have 15 Mason has 13 on three of eight from three Brayden goes for 12 and four assists five boards um the team overall is eight for 27 from three Arkansas was eight for 23 Purdue 20 turnovers Arkansas 15 turnovers uh, I 10 assists also for Purdue and they did not have a first half assist which is crazy to think about um I know those are kind of the main ones. Do you have, does anything else really pop off the, the page for you, Craig? Well, you know where I always go, Joe. Offensive rebounding <laughs> and the rebounding advantage. So, um, yeah, we were plus 13 in offensive rebounding. And, and with being minus in turnovers and shooting a lower percentage, that's really the only reason they were in this game. Um, and, you know, re rebounding in general, they were plus 14, but they were plus 13 in offensive rebounding. So I think obviously, I mean, we know, right, with this Purdue team and the type of bigs that we play with, that's always going to be a major advantage. Um, it continued to be a key advantage today as far as that goes. When you were talking about the lineup that really stalled out, who, who did you, I, in my notes, I had it was Gillis Morton first, Jones, and then I forget who the fifth person was. Gill and but, Morton. It was Heidi. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's. That was the first I, half lineup too, I think. So, I yeah. So correctly. I know you're putting it on the, the guards there um, a little bit, the way you're talking about in terms of shot creation. I actually thought it didn't work because they didn't have any post presence. That too. They, 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 assen the, they yeah. essentially were like swinging the ball around until somebody decided like I'm open enough to shoot a three. And I think where that was different in the second half is we saw several guys drive and shoot a five footer or pull up from 15 foot or whatever it was. Um, but I just, I, I thought when he, when he pulled, uh, he pulled TKR out first, right. And Gillis came in and Edie stayed on. And in my head, yeah. I thought, okay, here comes the staggered rotation. So that either Edie or TKR is on the floor all the time. Like that's where I thought that stagger would start. And then, and obviously he's trying to, you know, he's just trying out lineups in an exhibition game. Yeah. Um, 100%. But he throws first and Gillis out there together. And I just, I don't see, I don't see any scenario where that works. <laughs> I just don't. Um, I TKR and, and uh, first together, Gillis and Edie together, Edie and TKR together. I think all of those have their places to work. I just, I don't see how, how Gillis and first work. Um, Cause so much of what we do is playing through a post up and, and like neither of those guys have really shown that they're going to truly yeah. post up and have a post move. So. Yeah. It was the combo of you didn't have Braden Fletch, Edie or TKR on the floor. It's just like, and that's probably just one of those. It's an exhibition in the first half you try a lineup. I would also. Right. But I think Jones other, is fine out there. If TKR or Edie's in, I think Jones is fine yeah. out there in that guard spot. Then is enough of a creator, personally. Yeah, and then you're we're like we said, we're hoping Colvin or you know Heidi, you know, come along and maybe they can be a guy that. Um, why I mean Heidi's more of a I think secondary type like attacking closeouts and stuff, which he showed off really well in the one drive on the corner. Um, I also just didn't. I know TKR struggled somewhat in general. Uh, nine points, four for seven overall, three rebounds. Also, by the way, well, I'm just gonna jump in. We're doing it's doing a good job, or you guys are doing a good job in the chat, anyways. If you have questions, let us know. We're starring them. We're gonna probably get through them, uh, especially on these live shows where it is just me and Craig. Like, throw in your questions, and, and there's a better chance we do get to them. Um, also, just while we're here too, 
you know, if everybody's here, you're enjoying this uh, 20 minutes in already, and there's still plenty more to talk about, uh, please like, subscribe if you're on YouTube. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify podcast. That will be up tomorrow if you're there. On Twitter, uh, you can follow us at Boilers in the Stands. Uh, Boilers in Stands, sorry. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, we're doing a giveaway at 1,000 followers of a signed ED jersey. So if you are not, um, go to, I believe it is our pinned tweet at Boilers in Stands. You retweet that, follow us. You'll be in like the draw for the Zach Eady signed jersey. So definitely go do that if you aren't already. Um, I got a little bit sidetracked. I believe I was talking about Gil's TKR is where I was going to go to. Uh, I think... Un offensively, I definitely get that because now it's you still have TKR running through the post. Defensively, I am worried about that because I don't like TKR right now as a rim protector. And Gillis isn't that isn't his thing either. Um, and it just felt like there was a few, it felt like that, that was when Arkansas was getting their best looks at the rim, was against Gillis and TKR. Um, mm -hmm. whereas if you have at least first in, no matter who he's with, he can be somebody that's you know, he's 6'11, long, athletic, can defend near the rim. Obviously, Edie is elite at what he does. Um, that also just kind of stood out as like, I don't, that's something I'm, I'm going to monitor going forward. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the, the rotations I like, I think I just said them a, a second ago, but I, I like first with TKR. I, I like Gillis with Edie and I like Edie and TKR together. Um, as long as we're not playing against a super athletic four. Um, you know, TKR and ED out there together struggled defensively um, quite quite a few times um, just because – and it, there's only so many teams we're going to play uh, that have super long athletic fours. Um, yeah. And I would guess in a non-exhibition game, uh, I mean, Painter's been pushing the, the TKR, ED thing, and I think it's going to work a lot of games, um, that he wanted to play them together for them to get game time. But – if this was a real in season scenario, I think he pretty quickly realizes like, Hey, this isn't working defensively. And he goes to Gillis ED, um, like he did, um, at the end of the game when we had some really good defensive possessions. And then I think when Edie's off the floor, you know, then you have first and TKR out there together personally, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. And we can, this kind of relates to Tater allergy. He goes, I'm not seeing this ED TKR thing working out at least now when the other team has an athletic stretch four. you kind of hit on all that. And I think the athletic, the athletic four is the key part. I think if TKR can bang down low, it is going to be a problem for other teams because you know, you saw the one time TKR got a post up on the one block. ED is now the one diving to the opposite block. And so it's like, you pretty much have to throw three or four bodies in the paint We'll hit on the three point shooting in a bit, I'm sure. Um, and but that's going to generate either a TKR post up, which whether you like ED or TKR together or not, I think we would more or less all agree that TKR has, you know, he has some moves in the post. He can get his he can get his own. If they don't double off ED, now it's an ED possible dump off, and he's right at the rim now, um, maybe spraying out for three. So I, I think the athletic four part is the key thing about that. That's why you saw Gills more and just the ability to space. Um, TKR is going to have to prove his shot before teams really, you know, care about it. Even if he, you know, even right now, I think if he shoots one a game and he shoots like 35%, I don't think teams are going to care. Um, they're just going to be like, all right, we'll live with that one. And whatever it happens, happens. Um, but I still think there's hope for it overall. Like there's going to be some teams that just can't match up to both of them. And, and that's when you're really yeah. going to see that thrive. So, um, do we? Do you have other like key points you want to hit on? Do you want to start getting to some of these questions? Um, you know, I think obviously we need to address the elephant in the room a little bit. Um, I, you, you talked about Lawyer and Smith and them being sophomores and about them potentially being one of the best backcourts in the Big Ten or in the country, and, and I think that potential is there. Um, and I thought Smith did some incredible things tonight. I thought he was really aggressive in the first half and hitting those couple of threes that he did. Um, but you get to the end and you look at the stat sheet and he's got those seven turnovers, uh, you know, and, and some of them were just lackadaisical passes. Um, not, not necessarily even bad decisions. Just, just the passing itself was kind of, kind of lazy or lackadaisical at times. Um, and, and not purposeful or intentful. Um, so, I mean, that, that worries me, right? Uh, you know, FDU seven turnovers, right. And then exhibition game tonight, seven turnovers. So 
I, I am a huge Braden Smith fan. I was on the train real early of promoting the before it's all said and done. I think he's going to go down as one of the best Purdue point guards that's ever been here. I still believe that. Um, but it, but at some point we have to worry about the amount of turnovers that are being created by him at the same time. Right. Yeah. I'm no, 100%. Like I think the first 30 minutes he was really, really good. And then I don't know if it was tired or whatever, just started forcing a bit. The reads, like I understand the reads that he was making. Arkansas also did a really, really good job of rotating. Um, and I thought like they had a ton of backside help that got there. And so it was like, if Smith got the ball maybe a second earlier, I don't know if it's feasible to do that, but if he gets the ball a second earlier to like Edie on the roll, I think twice even, um, it's probably a dunk and not a turnover. So like the, I think the reads are there. It's just being able to put it all together with the aggressiveness. And it's going to be a line because I think I've pretty much all off season. I'm like, yeah. Braden, go be aggressive, go make mistakes. I'm still cool with some of the mistakes. Like I, it's just going to happen, especially with potentially how much on ball creation he's going to have to do at times. Um, but there is a line too of like, yeah, just, just balancing it. And, and I don't know exactly what that looks like. Like a, it is what it is. Um, but I, I think there is, he's got, he has to be aggressive. He has to force stuff at times, but also maybe, maybe it's more just like knowing the situation and knowing like, Hey, this is kind of late game. Like maybe we don't try that one because it's like, uh, this is too important of possession. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just, it's a tough bounce and I'm excited to see him grow, but yeah, the seven turnovers is for sure a worry. Um, yeah. But. And I, I guess one of the other things I, I'd like to mention when we talk about the three point shooting, um, I think a lot of people in the first half were watching and we're like, Oh, here we go again. You know, we, we can't yeah. hit a three and Braden was the only one that hit a three in the first half. Uh, Jones got fouled on one, got to the free sure. throw line, hits two out of the three. Um, but I, I guess what I was impressed with was in, in that second half, it didn't seem like anybody shied away from it. And, yes. and and after that FDU game and how people were, were almost kind of passing up that shot at some point um, and looking like they didn't want to take that shot, I I felt really good about the fact that they kept shooting through it. Mason kept shooting through it. Fletcher kept shooting through it. Um, it, and then, you know, in the end, Gillis shoots 40 some percent on the day. Um, lawyer ends up at 30 percent. Uh, one of them was a really tough four shot. But anyway, uh, with the shot clock running down. Uh, but th but they shot their way back to 30 percent. So first half, they shoot 15 percent. Second half, I think they end up shooting close to 45 percent. So I think there's some things to take away there of like, all right, they settled in. They started hitting some threes um, that are positive and they didn't. They, they kept stepping up confident to shoot those threes, I guess. They, they weren't shying away from it. So the uh, and the other thing, when we look back at that, the way the season ended last year, I, I did think they did a much better job in this game against, quite frankly, better competition with longer, more athletic defenders of saying, all right, like if, if we're not getting the post and we're not getting the three, we got to do some other things. And we saw people drive. We saw people do a little bit of mid-range stuff, that type of thing. So I think there is a little bit more of that ability on, on with this group than maybe what there was last year. Yeah, no, I the confidence thing you said, I was hundred uh, percent. Gillis especially, he was he was firing them up. He got to three of eight from three. You take that, um, and they were pretty much all good threes. It is crazy, like Gillis is, and it's for most shooters, but like Gillis is just so much better when he's stationary and doesn't have to move. Like it is, mm -hmm. it is crazy. Um, but yeah, three of eight from him. Like nobody seemed to be shying away, and that is super important. Like you said, uh, that was something that stood out to me too. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I really have like too too much else before we get to some of these questions. Like, it's an exhibition. It's not win or lose. Obviously, I you know, Painter was coaching to win. We all wanted them to win. It's not the end of the world. There are things to improve, one hundred percent. But this is like, this is going to, that's a great, that's a great test for like Maui and that. And then Maui's going to be a great test for the big 10 play. And, and it just kind of carries over to each other. So I'm still very, very excited about this team. And once again, we've gone 30 minutes. We didn't talk about Edie, uh, 15 and nine, like he, <laughs> he struggled a little bit. Um, some of it was just like, they were, Hey, they're super, they're a super, super long team. Um, a lot of times they had two, one or at least one or two defenders rotated on the weak side. And, um, 
it just was tough to get it to him. TKR had two turnovers on like the high low stuff just because he couldn't, you know, get through. Post passing was not good in general. Um, I don't, ex- you know, like ED had a bad game and he put up 15 and nine. And like that's just kind of the basis. Well, I mean, they had a really hard time establishing him in the post right out of the gate because the length and the pressure was really bothering the entry pass. Um, yeah. I thought, I don't know whether it was Painter changing how they were going about it or whether Braden just like kind of figured out how to manipulate the def- defense a little bit better in the beginning of that second half. But Edie was getting a lot easier, um, more open. Yeah. That the entry pass was definitely more open there at the beginning of the second half when they really started to focus on him. And then I think, like I said in a couple of shows ago, um, they did a lot of Edie rolling down through the lane. Um, and, and Braden given that little, uh, alley-oop or pass back when he was coming down. And I think we'll see a lot of that this year too. And I mean, Zach, I mean, think back to Zach's freshman year and think about him rolling down the lane like that, like at yeah. full speed, catching a ball as he's going up to dunk, like that just wasn't in his repertoire. <laughs> so like how much he's grown in that regard, uh, to me is pretty amazing. I thought he played really good defense a few times when he got put out on guards too, and like guys tried to kind of sh- blow by him and get downhill. And he did a really nice job of staying in front of a lot of them um, at, at different times tonight, especially down there towards the end. I just thought he had a hard time getting in a rhythm because, you know, he was in for five minutes foul and he sits for quite a while, comes back in um, every time. It seems like every game, there's a couple of his first shots that Zach shoots and it's like, like he doesn't have his touch. Like it's almost like that he kind of throws the ball at the rim on a first couple of shots. And then he finds his touch once he gets in a rhythm and then it's game on. And I just never felt like it was like, he kept coming back in and you were like, he doesn't have his touch yet. He doesn't have his touch yet around the rim. And it just took him a while to really get rolling there. Cause most of his points were dunks tonight or from the free throw line by and large. Um, I just didn't feel like he got in a rhythm with that little bank or that little turnaround float uh, hook shot. Um, but, you know, still 15, nine and 24 minutes, only 24 minutes in an overtime game. That's yeah. We, we played the number 14 team in the country and we're messing around with rotations and the national player of the year played mm, 20 minutes out of 40 in regulation and still yeah. went to overtime. So like <laughs> a little bit of context. 100%. And there should be context with pretty much everything in this game. Um, but yeah, it, you know, the outcome is what it is. There's still, I think there's still just a ton to be positive about. Edie's going to do his thing. Like he's just, he's going to get going on the block. This is a tougher matchup, like we said, just with all the <clears> physicality <throat> and length. Um, you know, there's a, there's been, I'm kind of looking through all the comments and there's just, there's talk about like the Smith Jones lawyer combo we'll hit on. Um, it's, I'm kind of laughing myself. Ethan Morton seems very polarized. There's some mm-hmm. like Ethan Morton shouldn't play, and then some like Ethan Morton needs to play way more. Um, that's always fun. So uh, we can get into some of these, and then we'll just riff from there. Uh, yeah. Derek Mullins goes, correct me if I'm wrong, but tonight turnovers and missed three point shots cost us. So are we just the same? I'm going to go with no because it's just one game against a tough opponent early on. Um, this is. Like this is there's a reason I assume Painter got this team specifically for an exhibition. This is a super long athletic team that hey Purdue struggles with a lot. Now you have experience with them. Like teams are not going to be able to pressure the ball in the half court like Arkansas did. There's a few like Michigan State probably can, um, but they don't have like the length to go with it. Um, Rutgers like usually just figures out a way to do stuff like like it's just not a co- as co- it's not going to be a crazy common thing. Yeah, um, the three point shot. I think they started out two for fourteen, if I'm correct, and then went yeah. six of thirteen. I'm hoping it's not another super streaky year. I believe in the guys. Like I believe in the missed shooters. Jones is one for five from three. Um, you know, Brain and Fletch are both two of six. Like it is. It. I don't know. I, I think they're gonna they're gonna be fine there too. Yeah, and. And like I said a a couple of times, like I thought, especially in in the second half when they came back out, some guys started doing other things than just the the first half felt the same to me, Derek. Like it was like poster three, poster three, poster three. And we weren't hitting our threes and they were making it really hard to get it into Zach. I thought the second half we did a lot better job of driving. Lawyer did it a little bit the first half too, uh, but he converted on several of those in the second half. Jones got in the paint a few times. Heidi has that drive. 
Um, and even if they miss them, then there was chances for offensive rebounds, right? Because yeah. those three point those three point misses are coming way out. So then it's way harder for Zach or TKR to get that offensive rebound. If I'm driving in and I'm shooting a four or five foot or little soft touch off the backboard and it rims out, it's right there for Zach or for TKR or whoever. So those that to me was a positive sign, especially that we were able to get into the paint or that mid range against a team like Arkansas. Um, Arkansas is the highest ranked Ken Palm defensive team that Purdue faces the entire season. So just un understand that they're number nine in Ken Palm. We don't play a team the rest of the year. I, obviously, Ken Palm is going to change some, right? So he's basing it off last year and the guys that are out there. But as of right now, Ken Palm would say this is the best defensive team that we will play the entire year. Um, so that we could do some of those things against a team like Arkansas, I thought was positive. And I guess the other thing for me was they they shot through that slump um, and and shot over 40 percent in the second half. So I, I don't feel like we're quite the same. And I think once Cam and Miles figure out a way to work in the rotation a little bit more, that also makes this different. I don't know what this is about, really. Um, are you on mute? I am. Uh, Corey <laughs> Lesney goes, if you play Smith, Lawyer, and Jones, Edie's chances will be cut in half. Um, do you say, I, I'll take a stab at it. I assume he just means like, Teams are going to not respect them on the perimeter. Um, and I think, I think one, we just need a bigger sample size. Maybe you could 100% be right in the long run. Like it's, it's a possibility. Um, I want to see it against different types of teams also before I, I really go there or anything like that. The other thing is just, and I think this is the more, my more relevant answer is like teams are going to put two to three bodies off ball on Edie. It is just going to happen every game. Um, I don't, it does. I don't think it really matters what lineup you have out there. Like Edie is just going to demand a ton of attention and that's just, it's just going to, how it's going to be. There's going to be games that it's just the ball can't really get to Edie because you'd have to go through six arms to get it there. Yeah. I, I guess I just don't really understand it from the standpoint of like Smith lawyer Jones. Yeah, I mean, like, who who else are you going to put out there that's a better chance? I mean, maybe you could say Colvin, um, but Colvin's got to figure out where he's supposed to be defensively and, and just, yeah. like, he will in time. Um, that's just a natural progression. But, like, I don't know who else you put in those three that you're saying directly related to getting Edie his touches by stretching the floor than those three guys. So... Jones didn't shoot the ball well tonight, um, but Jones Jones is a very capable three point shooter. He got in the paint for us a couple. He he can do that other thing. Like Jones can get into the paint for us, um, whereas we don't really have a lot of guys that have a good enough handle to be able to do that. He's got a physical body that can absorb contact. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree there. I guess. Yeah, the you know, I would I would say maybe Morden because he can just he's probably our second best post entry passer. Right. Maybe, but oh, maybe that's that. where it was going. Yeah. I don't know. Um, we'll jump to, did we already do this? Taterology. Uh, I'm not seeing this EDTKR thing working out. Uh, at least now when the other team has an athletic stretch for, I think we already hit on this, right? Yeah. We already talked about it. Um, yeah. I, I think we kind of started talking about it when we saw it pop up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll go to the next one. Um, Corey Lesney again. Painter's trying to fix something that isn't broken. Gillis and Morton need to play a lot because they both know how to play with Edie. There's also just TK, TKR, Jones, Waddell to an extent, Heidi, Colvin, uh, all just need reps playing with Edie. Like they just haven't gotten a ton of reps. So, like, yes, Gillis and Morton are going to be way more comfortable right now playing alongside Edie. Uh, they're like, yeah, Gillis will stretch the floor. Morton's, I think, you know, probably. I still think Fletch is the best post entry passer. Um, Morton's a you know capable post entry passer, so I get that. But um, I think it's just a little bit. They just need a little bit of time. Like it isn't, mm -hmm. shouldn't be perfect right away. Yeah, and that the TKR high low action um, in terms of an entry pass down to Edie worked a lot in a small sample size last year. So I'm not like super worried about that. Um, again, 
the the four that we played tonight. Uh, shoot, what was his name? Um, gosh, dang it. Uh, who, whoever Arkansas's four was, right? Like, like he's projected to go in the draft. Brazil? Yeah. Yeah. He's, proje- he's projected to go in the draft. He's a six foot 10, six foot nine, super athletic four. Um, there's only so many of those that we're going to face all, all year long. So I'm not overly worried about the TKR entry pass, um, from that standpoint. Yeah. Like things to improve, but it will, should improve. Um, We'll move on to Blake Widmer said Fletch didn't impress me that much. He's still getting any stronger. In my opinion, looks easy to push. There's going to be matchups. I think that sure that happens. He got to the rim against, you know, one of the arguably the best defense Purdue will play multiple times. Um, He took guys off the dribble, off a screen, got to the paint, got to the rim. Um, I was super impressed with like that. He was probably my, he probably was the best player to me today um, on the floor. Like he just, he, Purdue, this could have been a 10, 12 point loss in regulation. Uh, lawyer had some plays there that kind of calmed the tide a bit and it kept them in it, I thought. Yeah. And he f- finished all of those through contact. Like, like yes. on every one of those drives, he took contact and still finished. Um, and, and it wasn't a layup, taking contact on a layup. He took contact and still hit a little four to five ba- foot bank shot um, or three foot bank shot, whatever you want to say. Um, so I, I don't, he, when you look at him, he doesn't look stronger. Um, <clears throat> but I've heard a lot of guys say with shooters, right. That, that you don't want necessarily for your arms to get real ripped up. Right. Um, some of those guys that get really strong and bulky in their arms, it, it changes the way they shoot a little bit. Um, it's really more about your core with shooters in terms of trying to build that. That's a harder thing to see, to be like, all right, is he, is he stronger in his core? But I actually thought he absorbed contact better tonight than maybe I saw him do all year last year in terms of going to the rim. So, yeah, no, I, I was like, I said, super impressed. Um, we have some more we'll get through anybody. You know, we have a lot of people in here. Appreciate everybody tuning in, uh, like subscribe, all that. If you have any questions, comments, throw them in the chat. Uh, there's a lot of people in here kind of hanging out, talking through this. So if you have questions, especially we will like, we have time right now. We can get to them. Um, this is another comment from Blake Widmer. Uh, two to one turnover to assist ratio, not assist to turnover, turnover to assist. Yes, that was, uh, yeah, like that was tough. Uh, so many turnovers, especially in the first, I think the first half, I could look it up right now. Zero assists and 11 turnovers in the first half. Uh, I do think, and I you kind of alluded to it earlier, I do think Purdue handled it better for the second half. It seemed like a lot of the guys started getting used to it. Um, and then we already mentioned the Braden down the stretch thing. I don't, I don't, we don't need to really rehash that, but even like the first 10 minutes of the second half for him, I thought he was much better in control. Like you said, getting the ball to ED, things like that. Um, but yeah, you, you just can't have more turnovers than assists and expect to win many games like that. No. <clears throat> um, <laughs> all, so, all I really got to that is no, we can't. Yeah, just, um, yeah, that That's, know. That's got to change. Has to, yeah. one way or another. So, uh, um, Corey Lesney. So, how about Jones' shooting percentage? Two for eleven, I, one for five from three. You go. And if you've watched film on Jones, like, like this is who Lance is. He's gonna have some games where he shoots sixty percent from three, or, or you know, like he's he's more of a streaky guy. He's he's gonna have some games where he shoots a really high percentage. He's gonna have some games where he shoots a lower percentage. But from the guard spot. Um, he has the capability of doing some things that nobody else on the floor can that we have currently, um, in my mind, uh, in terms of just there two or three times he got by people and not on that curl necessarily the way Fletcher does it. He just er, early offense went and got by people and attacked the rim. The one time he misses that he gets the put back, he gets contact again when he goes back up and he finishes through that. I, you know, a, a guy who's playing for Purdue for the first time against another team in an arena like that like i am i am not worried about jones shooting percentage i don't think any of us think that he's gonna be like a dead eye 40 percent shooter um but i think he finishes somewhere around 35 percent, 34 percent from three and i was calling for him to get the ball at the end of regulation because we're <laughs> like i i just believe jones is that dude that can be like i'm oh a 10 and i'm gonna knock this down like he doesn't care and in overtime, when we went down five, 
Who'd they go to? They went Lance, to Jones. I assume. They went to Lance. I and, 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 and Lance drilled his first three of the entire game. Oh, and it yes, looked, yes, yes. And it, it looked perfect. Um, looked like the greatest shot in the world. Um, but that to me, there's like big shot takers and big shot makers, and there's guys that aren't. And Lance, to me, is that... <clears throat> That guy that just has no, <clears throat> no conscience and is is perfectly comfortable taking it at that time, and he played a really good defense. Like in terms of anybody that was out there tonight, I think Lance played better one on one defense than anybody in the game. Um, and I yeah. I was also kind of screaming for Lance to be in Ethan's spot those last two plays where Ethan got torched one on one down the stretch in overtime. Uh, you know I I. I mean, it's got to be one of those two, right? Yeah. Um, I just think Lance handles the shiftiness. Like Morton's really good against length, but I yeah. think Lance Lance handles the shiftiness of a guy better than what Morton does personally. I would have loved to seen him being that that their best player up uh, there at the end of the game, but it is what it is. So, I yeah, I mean Jones has to shoot a better percentage. He's going to have some games where he has a low percentage. He's going to have some games where he has a really high percentage. That's the type of guy he is. Um, but that's – I don't think you have Jones out there because you expect him to shoot 42% from three. No. Um, if Jones eventually just wants to not uh, spot up like five feet behind the three-point line, I would I, – I think it might help him a little bit there too. Uh, I know he had the one – he had the one super step back three because he just had to put it up. I'm not blaming him for right. that one. But there's, it just seemed like – like it's what he did um, at Southern Illinois. It was just like just spotting up super deep. Um, and I get that for, for a spacing standpoint, like there is some quality to it, but I don't know. It, it's something I'm going to keep watching going forward. But yeah, I'm with you. Like he had a bad shooting night. I'm going to maintain some positivity. Like he's not going to be an elite shooter. He's going to have a one or two games where he's probably like just on absolute fire. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, hopefully some games that he's, you know, two of five or one of three or something like that. And, and you just do live with what he does. Um, did you yeah, I'm. Oh, you go. I, I'm sold that I, I'd like. I'd be willing to bet a dinner on the fact that Jones has at least one thirty-point game this year. Thirty. I don't think anybody besides Edie had that last year, right? Uh, didn't Gillis the night that he hit all those threes? He might have. Didn't he hit ten? To... Nine. No, he hit nine. Okay. Um, I could look it up right this it's... second. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just had 29, one of two for two and nine of 12 from three. I got you. Yeah. No, I, I just, I think Jones is going to have a couple of big scoring games for us in, in my mind. Some, sometime during the year. Yeah, no, I I'm with you. He, um, I also, I'm going to use this time. I'm, we're going to, um, oh, because sorry. on our last show, whenever that was last week or whatever, the, maybe the painter show, um, or painter interview, which if anybody hasn't watched, definitely go check that out after we finish with this live show. We got to interview Matt Painter, really great interview, learned a lot of stuff. Um, I was very set skeptical of the defensive trio of Smith, Lawyer, um, Jones, and I'm more on like, oh, I get it. Like, I, mm -hmm. so I talked with some people and stuff, and it's like, I don't, ex I think where I'm at now is I don't ever expect to see that lineup, that trio without ED on the floor. But right. with Edie, it's like, okay, yeah, you're just forcing guys, trying to force guys in the mid-range anyways and have Edie come up and contest. Um, I, I And Jones is good defensively, so he can do that. And, like, in terms of size, if a team had a bigger three and they really wanted to get a smaller guy, like, they're just going to eventually force a switch from Braden anyways or Fletch, whoever they want. Um, so I think, like, have, it's not like... I don't see teams ever like switching on to Jones. So I just, I'm, I just want to throw that. I'm like, okay, I, I get the vision a bit more there. Um, and I'm, I'm not as concerned about it defensively. Yeah. Um, who, who was right about the starting lineup last week, Joe? I, you were after fan day, you put up the tweet, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, cause yeah, that was the last lineup we were like, Oh yeah. But, um, a few more comments, uh, looks like, uh, Braggs is tuning in from wherever he's at. So is the oh, season geez. over? Uh, yeah, right. Um, Jeff Parks goes with is Braggs talking about the Bears? Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, yes, their season is over, Jeff. We'll move That's on very... from there. I'm assuming you <laughs> starred this one, so I'm gonna let you take it. Um, 
I hate IU said, did you guys think the fouls called on Edie were fair? I don't think he fouled out once last year. He did not foul out last year. Um, oh, the, there was one, uh, where he grabs a rebound over a guy or like tips a rebound over a guy. I think it was his second foul that was uh, second, yeah. where, where he doesn't really touch the guy. And I think a little bit of that is I'm assuming those were primarily sec based officials today. I don't really know. Um, there's not a lot of seven foot four dudes in the SEC. <laughs> um, so, I, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's always an adjustment uh, of just like, oh, like he's tall enough that he can reach over a guy and even bend down a little bit and still not actually make contact with a guy. Um, yeah. Other than that, the other fouls were fouls. Um, I, I think all of them were besides that one. But I actually I started that because I thought the question was about people fouling Edie. Um, Fran ah. Fraschilla, Fran Fraschilla yeah, put out a tweet that. that of the video and was like, you can't let a guy push off, push Edie three times in a row in the back and then call Edie for a foul the first time he like pushes back on him. Um, but I think it's really important that, it, especially in these non-conference games, that Edie's not going to get refereed the right way a lot of times just like Shaq did it um just like Yao did it like but they've got to figure out when that's happening Zach's got to figure out how to play through it and everybody else around him has to figure out how to play through it you can't rest on that yep or we'll um, get beat yeah I got nothing nothing to add there uh, this is another one that's going to be more up your kind of alley. Uh, Tater Allergy goes, I really thought TKR would be more, be a lot more like Vince Edwards, but I think he's much more like Carl Landry. Thoughts on that? Um, I mean, Vince is Mason Gillis with a post game. Um, it, Vince was, Vince was really, well, I don't want to say our first stretch for, because it depends on what you call Juwan. I mean, Juwan kind of played the center spot, but was technically as a power forward. Um, so depending on the year, but no, I think, um, I, I guess I never thought about TKR's Vince, Vince Edwards. I think TKR will be able to hit some threes in the same way that Biggie hit some threes. Um, I think he's probably closer, not as good as Caleb, but he's closer to Caleb in terms of the way he plays that he can shoot those threes and he's going to step out and do it. But man, Vince was mobile. Um, like Vince could shot fake, drive by a guy, get up to the rim and throw it down. But Vince also had a really nice post up turnaround game from five to 10 feet. Um, I, I don't think we've had many guys like Vince. And I mean, that's why Vince made an NBA team there for a little while. And I think he's still over in Europe playing ball. Uh, he was a really, really versatile four in, in my mind. So, um, yeah, no, I don't think he's ever going to be Vince. Um, personally, I did not see him being like Vince. Um, I Really, this pairing to me is a little bit more like when we played Caleb and Isaac together, except, um, I mean, I, I I do think both of these guys in ED and TKR are a little bit more mobile and a little bit more lateral than either one of those two. Yes, I, uh, yes, that's, I, uh... I don't know if anybody actually knows this. I've been I've been a Purdue fan for six years, so like I don't. It's something I want to get to eventually. Brush up on my history. Um, I became a Purdue fan when I went to Purdue my freshman year. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't got a lot to add for all that stuff. Um, Blake Winmers goes. We missed sev weak side several times, forcing it to Edie, even when they had fully rotated a backside defender to double prior to the pass. Um, so you're, I, he's trying to say, like, still forcing it to Edie, even though there was the defense already set. Is that what he you think he's trying to say? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with that. Okay, if it's that, um, I, I think sometimes that they forced it was turnovers. Like, I also think Painter's going to eventually just he's gonna have times where he just schemes up stuff, and it's gonna get Edie touches no matter what the defense is like. Um, if you're talking about like skipping the ball because the defense was rotated, um, that's definitely possible. Like now that like, I'm just kind of trying to think through it in my head right now. Um, definitely it's possible. Like if that defense is rotated to that backside, like that makes sense. Then you have your low man rotated over to help dig in and you probably have even the opposite wing defender. He's probably coming in to dig. And so there should be a skip pass there. You got to trust your shooters to be able to do that. Um, which we've already kind of hit on the three-point shooting a little bit for this. 
but it's just it's going to be a give and take. It's it's like there you can force the ball to Edie whenever you want, more or less. Mm, I take that back. You can attempt to force the ball to Edie whenever you want. If that if that's kind of the case, though, you do have to live with um, some of the turnovers that happens, like the TKR high lows. It's just it is what it is. Like he had two turnovers, high low action. That's not going to happen every game. Um, but yeah, and then if you do skip, you got to trust guys to hit threes. That's where, or even attack closeouts. And that's where I think, I think that's where I'm at with all of like the Purdue needs guys that can generate their own shot. I think they need guys that can, uh, they need at least one. I mean, they need Braden to create, create for everything. Another one other guy would be great. And then they just, they need guys that can attack bent defenses or rotated defenses. And what I mean by that is like drive, kick. Heidi did it today. Drive, kick to the corner, and he takes two dribbles, dunks it. Um, it's not always have to be a three. It's just – and you don't always have to self-create. It's, oh, this guy's closing out. I'm just going to blow by him and get to the rim. Edie's there. They're not going to help off of Edie. Now I have a layup or a dunk. Or they do help. Now I can dunk it off to Edie. Um, and, you know, I, I, that's the biggest thing too. Lawyer did it a couple, at least once for sure today, probably I think twice – He's going to get that because he's respected as a shooter. Teams are going to fly out on him on the perimeter. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be tough overall. Uh, I think, you, yeah, you said uh, find the tape show. That was plan is to have a thread out tomorrow. I don't know exactly where yet, um, but we will definitely be there. Um, so, yeah, uh, there we go. Moving on, just have a few left. Um, this was from Paul S. Oh. Wait, you gotta you gotta get this one in from Braggs first. Oh, from from Braggs, hit the like button or I will haunt your nightmares as Bowser in your sleep. Um, I don't know who Bowser is, but you don't know who Bowser is? No. From Mario? From what? Mario? Never heard of it. No, you're joking. You're joking. <laughs> no, I've never heard of it. What like, is it? I I know that it's a video game, and I get that it, it not everybody video games, but I I just felt like. You didn't hear like the Super Mario Brothers movie? That was a huge Dude, thing. The last video I played was Pong. <laughs> That's I I played there, Madden. There, I I played comments, like am I am I am I in the wrong for this one for like thinking it's kind of crazy that he doesn't at least like have knowledge of Mario um in some capacity. Maybe maybe I'm if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Um uh, but I, that's I, uh I just don't know. I, I played Madden 94 when I was in college um, and, and I played Pong, but I was never a big uh, video gamer. I, I remember when we got the first Atari set at home. That's how old I am, Joe. You're trolling. I, th I don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what Bragg said still stands. Make sure to hit the like button. Uh, we appreciate it. We've had good, you know, a lot of people tuned in throughout this entire show. We're going to have these after every single game. Um, away games will be immediately after the show. We waited a little bit today just because football was going on and all that. Um, home games, kind of just you have to work with us. We'll let you know. Some games it might be right after. Some games we might all do post-game pressers and things like that. And so maybe be 45 minutes after this uh, game ends. But um, this is from Paul S88. Uh, Daily, let your, so the dream team lose his exhibition to college team to smack them in shape. I love I love this angle. Yeah, Purdue, you know, loses their exhibition game, so that way they can just torch through everybody this year. Well, and like I said it before the game started, or or really shortly after the game started, I can't remember. It, it didn't matter. It would have been great if they won today. Um, but people are trying different rotations, everything else. They're trying to win, especially in the second half. You could tell they were trying to win. Um, but they scheduled a game against the type of team that gives them trouble all the time. Yeah. Um, and one of the best and, at that too. And one of the most athletic, like we said, right now, the best rated defense that we technically should face the entire year. Um, this game will make us better no matter what. And there's going to be a ton of film for Painter to cover with these guys about um, things that they could do better. So I'm, um, and I, I could care less um, that they lost this game in the end. It's going to make them better down the road. Yep. Um, a few more Jonathan Long. We've kind of hit on all of this, so we don't have to go crazy in depth. Uh, three points. We, we didn't. We didn't talk about the free throw misses, and that was a little we bit did. troubling, well, especially with TKR. 
we'll yeah we'll hit on that so jonathan longo's three-point shooting percentage turnovers key free throw misses in parentheses sounds familiar seems gillis got tkr's end of game minutes as he assumes it is because he was hitting his threes um do this so we'll go kind of piece by piece is there anything on the three-point shooting that you want to add to what we've no. already said they missed yeah. in the first half they played through it they hit in the second half yep uh turn they were generating good shots also like yeah. there's only a couple forced threes um Turnovers, I think we've hit on like athleticism, length, this pressure, half court. Like we've probably said that 15 times. I don't think we need to go into that. Key free throw misses, uh, 17 of 25 from the free throw line. Uh, Fletch was one of two. Braden, four of four. Lance, four of six. ED, seven of eight. And then uh, first 0 for one. And then TKR was one for four. It doesn't look pretty to put it um, somewhat nicely. Like, I it just it seems weird. It's like he's almost shooting from like uh, for anybody that's looking, you know, listening on audio. So it's almost like not Sean Marion esque because that was way down, but like it seems like he's like pushing from here almost. And I'm not like a shot doctor or anything, but it's just something seems off. Yeah. And it's to me the his, his shot motion looks completely different from three than it does shooting yes. a free throw in terms of his release point and the arc on the ball. I, I just thought he shot really flat um several times. Um and I don't remember what his his percentage wasn't real high last year either. Um, well, but yeah, it, it looked a little bit rough, but that's going to, if we're yeah. going to feature him in the post, it's going to have to be something that gets better. Um, I think if you look at the history of Purdue players and painters era over time, they've all gotten significantly better the longer that they've played. So I expect that to keep rising as the year goes on. Uh, TKR was 64.4%. He was 38 of 59 from the line last year. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't got too much more on that. Like, uh, oh, that's No, that's what I was going to do was I was currently looking up Lance Jones's numbers from last year from the free throw line. And I'm just stalling while I get the numbers up. Uh, he was 76%. Well, yeah. He'll be so through his career, he's 64, 69 56 and 76 percent all about 100 attempts per year um so he's it's not like he's a great free throw shooter either and that actually is a little worrisome especially if he's going to be a guy trying to get to the rim a ton too you said he shot 76 percent last year 76 last year but the year before was 56 mm. well i'm gonna um, uh, cherry i'm gonna ball. cherry i'm gonna cherry pick and go off last year well, and say free throw free throw shooting to me generally is something that gets better and then stays better. It doesn't normally regress in my mind. Uh, the last part of that though, seems Gillis got TKRs in the game minutes uh, because of three point shooting. I would say maybe um, I really think Gillis got his minutes because of defense um, and, and just how much better defensively I put in my notes a couple different times, TKR and ED struggling with an athletic four, um, it, at times they were getting a lot of penetration and then swinging it out. Purdue was just late on rotations because they got out of their system. Uh, because of the penetration they were able to get, I thought a lot of that had to do with TKR being beside Edie. And I think um, we saw, especially at end of game, that defensively we were just a lot better uh, with Gillis next to Edie. Again, I think there's going to be a ton of games where that's not near as much of an issue, and the offensive output of TKR compared to his defensive liability is going to outweigh that. And that's something that Eater's not Eater, something that paint, <laughs> something that Painter has pushed of like, okay, even if TKR isn't our best defensive four out there, what he can do offensively, like what's what's your trade off, right? Um, what's the marginal cost of having of having him out there? So um, I do think a lot of times that's going to outweigh. I think tonight it, he figured out eventually that it didn't outweigh what TKR was providing offensively, and that's why we saw Gillis out there at the end. Yeah, I, I think you you nailed it there. I don't got much to add. Um, Eric Kamel goes, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Edie looked better defensively on the perimeter today. I was an advocate last year that Edie wasn't terrible on the perimeter. Obviously, you're not going to like put him out there on purpose. I thought he improved too. Like You could see him even get into a little bit of a deeper stance. Yeah. There's and also it's when teams get easy to switch onto a guard, their offense goes out the window. It is becomes I'm going to ISO Zach Eady. Now guys like Tyson Walker can like kind of um like Tyson Walker is a bad one for him because <laughs> he can hit a step back three. And so he can be really shifty, lunge, step back. 
there's not a ton of guys that are going to shoot it as well as like guys like Walker. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of like players just think they can take Edie off the dribble to the rim. And I think they forget that. Yes, he's bigger than you. He is seven, four with like a seven, 10 wingspan. He does. He could even give up a step and, and there's going to be, he's going to, if not block your shot at the rim, very much contest. Um, I was, I was very impressed. Even just like there was the one time, um, it was a high pick and roll. He's in his deep drop. Nothing comes of it. They reset. There's eight seconds. Another pick and roll. It's now as it's, he's coming off the screen. This is Arkansas, obviously. Um, there's like six seconds. Edie's up two steps higher in his drop. Like he's closer to the level now because he's like, okay, there's not much time. He's going to have to put up a jumper. So now he's even there for the jumper too. Um, and, and just was able to stay in front. And I forget the exact, I'm pretty sure it was a missed shot. Um, I just don't think it like there's going to be a handful of players that can for like take advantage of it almost every play. I just I think more often than not when it happens like some people players are going to get his there's some time against him but it's not nearly as much as players are going to think that it's it's going to happen. Yeah, and there was one time in overtime, uh, I don't remember if it was still tied or if they were up to, but somebody got ISO'd on Edie and you could see him sizing him up and like Zach got super super low and kind of like you got the feeling that he was like, all right, come on, like, let's do it. And the guy thought he had a step on him and Zach chased him all the way to the rim. And the guy just bailed out because he realized he had no chance. And I'm like, OK, Zach, Zach, a lot of times last year chased a guy down because of his length. Um, he would get beat and be behind him and he would still get the block because of his length. But he was today. I thought he did a lot better job of moving and staying you know, right beside them all the way to the rim uh, to the point where they didn't even try it because they knew it wasn't, they they didn't, they didn't have enough space to, to even try it personally. So yeah, I, th I thought he got better too. I think Chase Cat said something on Twitter too uh, earlier, just about how much, how much better he thought Edie looked laterally in terms of his quickness defensively tonight. Yeah. It just, yeah. yeah, it just looked even better. Um, yeah. And that's like only a good thing for Purdue. So last one, we kind of have, um, and then we'll get going from our very own Braggs. Uh, did TJR so like uh, I'm Trey assuming. Jackson Wren? <laughs> Trey, that one, I don't, uh, did he meant did TKR hurt or help his chances of playing alongside Edie on a more routine basis? We've kind of already hit on this. My answer is it just needs more time, and we'll see if this this bad after three, you know, um. Not this bad, but if there's a lot of the issues after three, four, five more games or whatever, or a couple Big Ten games, and it's like, okay, this isn't going to work, yeah, pull the plug, whatever. But right now, just just want to see it more against different teams. Yeah, I don't know that he hurt his chances. Again, I think this team that we play today is fairly unique to what we're going to play throughout the regular season schedule, so I, I don't know that it's reflective uh, statistically of what they're going to actually match up against most games. Um, I do, you know what, Zach only took two shot attempts in the first eight minutes, I think it was, or something like that. Um, he only took and, two and shot attempts in the first 20 minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, some of that was foul trouble, right? Yeah. yeah but yeah. but but also, like, especially in those first eight minutes of the game, I was just like, we weren't getting established. And, you know, I the thought did right, rise in my head of, are they just doing a really good job of early in the game when everybody's got a bunch of energy and they're just really limiting that entry pass and making it very difficult during this part. And then eventually they wear down, you know, like most teams do and he starts getting better looks or is TKR in there hurting the spacing to the point and clogging up the lane where it's just that much harder for Edie to get it. I think it was more the first than the second um, of that tonight, but it, it's something obviously we'll have to monitor and see. Yeah, um, one real. I'm just gonna. There's one more thing that came up. Corey Lesney, you can't feed Edie with TKR and Jones on the court. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to say that you're like wrong because you very well could be right. I also know for a fact I could pull up clips from last year where it's more than TKR and Edie on the floor, and they, TKR and Edie both got good post ups and buckets. Um, like I said, like we need a larger sample size to for sure. Um, at least for me. Um, I can like I I know there's clips on my Twitter account that show like oh wow look how Edie and TKR are used together and this is so good because you have to worry about both of them and now we're getting you know 
Purdue was getting wide open looks at the rim or really good looks at the rim where they shot 80% together last year when they were on the court together. Um, so that's my thing. It's just like, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, but there's, I'm not saying that you, yeah, you can 100% be right. Um, but there's also, there have been good things with this duo that very well could come from it. So we are at an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, on an exhibition before, game. <laughs> yeah, we said before, we're like, yeah, maybe we don't even need to go an hour. Uh, it's a bad bad sign or a good sign, however you want to look at it, for our uh, games, post-game shows during the season. Um, do you have any kind of last take points you want to just throw out there before we head out? Yeah, I, I guess the only other thing I would say is, you know, an interesting thing about Purdue fandom for me is we like to, we really glorify and love the fact that like we get these guys that maybe aren't super high recruits um, in terms of star ranking that don't fit the athletic profile of, of having that extra height and length and athleticism that could potentially make them an NBA player, right? Like Braden Smith and Fletcher lawyer are not going to be NBA players. They are going to be really, really good college players, but chances of either of them making the NBA aren't real good. And, as Purdue fans, by and large, I'm generalizing here, but we glorify that. And we talk about how we get guys that play the right way, that play super fundamental, um, that play better than what their ranking is and all of those sort of things. I think it's also important to remember that when we do that, and then and then we get into a game like this, and, and you'll be like, well, you know, why can't Fletcher Lawyer stop this guy? You, you mean this dude that's 6'7 and <laughs> can jump out of the gym? Like, you want him to guard him one-on-one -on -one and expect him to stop him. All I'm saying is if you're going to glorify and buy into this, we get guys that are super fundamental. Maybe they're undersized. They got fight, all of those sort of things. That's great. Um, and, and I love that too, but we're going to have times where one-on-one -on -one matchups, when we go up against those true NBA prospects uh, where we just don't match up and you, you take the good with the bad, because on the other side of that, you hope that that extra grit, that fight, that fundamentalism, all of those sort of things lead us to an advantage in some ways. But you just you have to understand that sometimes that matchup is a matchup that's not very winnable uh, one on one. And you hope team defense wise um, that they can do enough to stop it. So that's my only little rant about that. I have a, I have a little rant, too. Um this is an exhibition. There are lots of things to take away. I think we all kind of have an understanding, for the most part, have an understanding, like, this doesn't define the season. My thing is, um, and I think it's hard for us Purdue fans because of, I mean, even just in, like, I've, I've been a Purdue fan for six years, and I've had the three really, you know, I've had the North Texas, St. Peter's, FDU losses, and then I had the Virginia Elite Eight game. And that's only in six years. So I know there's lifelong fans and much, much more. So it's kind of like, I think in our nature just to expect the shoe to drop um, and just for bad things to come at some point this year. And it didn't happen in this exhibition game that doesn't actually matter in the long run is good times are going to come and just enjoy them. Like it's, this is a special year. This is not where, you know, Purdue is not a blue blood of Duke, Kansas, where it's, this is the expectation to be a top three team and, and, legitimate national championship contender every year Purdue's heading in the much very good direction and lots of good guys coming up that you know painter is kind of starting to build this machine where they're top 20 like pretty much guaranteed but this high level of expectation like just isn't common um and so just enjoy it like there's doesn't mean you can't be upset about things that go bad doesn't mean you can't be like hey why is this happening or this guy wasn't not saying that just when the good times do come please enjoy them because it should be fun. Like college basketball is fun. I enjoy doing all this, you know, having everybody tune in, talk with Craig Braggs, um, answer, you know, questions, interact with you guys. So just when that happens, please enjoy. Um, so appreciate everybody tuning in. Yeah. You know, we, to that, to that point though, Joe, I'm going to come back with one more thing. I've already seen some Purdue fans start to say, well, it doesn't matter anyway until like nothing matters till March, nothing matters till March. Like, Dude, what a miserable way to be a fan. <laughs> like, if you're going to watch the first three months and we say we get a dramatic win in Hawaii or something like that, and you're going to just say, well, it doesn't matter till March. Like, come on, get over it. Um, 
yes, that monkey is on their back and they have to have March success. But yes, just just to me from a fandom standpoint, like why why would you want to watch and think that way for three months until we get to March, man? Like, come on, enjoy the journey, like Joe said. Yep. So um yeah, like I said, we appreciate everybody tuning in for an hour and 15 on an exhibition game. We will be back November 1st for Purdue's exhibition against Grace College, I believe. Um, like I said, to be determined on whether it's directly after the show or 45 minutes, you know, you can find us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Um, if you are on YouTube, please like and subscribe. That just helps us a ton. Appreciate all the comments and stuff and interacting. That also, one, makes the, our show better, especially when it's going to be me and Craig. I don't have brags to, to fill in the gaps, um, but just enjoy it in general, too. So we're also on Twitter, um, like I said, at Boilers in Stands. I'm going to repeat for, you know, search us on Twitter at Boilers in Stands. If you have not already, follow in our pinned tweet. If it isn't pinned, I'll make sure it's pinned right now. Um, our, it should be our pinned tweet is a giveaway for a Zach ED signed jersey. All you got to do to be in it is subscribe or follow us on Twitter at Boilers in the Stands. Retweet that. Once we get to a thousand followers, we are going to be giving that away to one of the people that meets the criteria. So um, we're also on Apple, Google, Spotify. If you're listening the day after, all of our stuff will be there. Please, you know, give a five star review, leave a review. Uh, that's Boilers in the Stands on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcast. I believe that is everything for this. You can follow Craig on Twitter at Craig Bowers 34. Also part of Boiler Diehards, the Facebook group with what? Over 12,000, 13,000, 12, somewhere in there. Over like 12,000 fans, uh, Purdue fans. It's vetted, you know, really good stuff over there. Good community. You can follow me on Twitter at Joe Jackson CBB. Um, and yeah, like I said, be back Wednesday for sure. Thursday, we have a show lined up. Uh, can we, are we promoting who it's with? Yes, with, definitely. Uh, that is locked in. Yep. So Thursday with uh, Haslam Metrics. So that'll be fun kind of previewing the Purdue season schedule, some of the teams they'll play in non-conference, stuff like that. Yeah. That was the, a lot. Oh, the week the week after that, too. I, I think we can go oh, ahead yeah. and say it, and if it doesn't work out, fine. Um, <clears throat> we should have – so this, this coming week, we're going to have Haslam Metrics on and do a schedule preview show. Um, that following week, um, we confirmed with Conzo Martin – um to have a show with him uh, i think it'll be that wednesday of that week he does want us to just double check with him one more time as we lead into that week and make sure everything's still good for him uh but it looks like we're going to get to have Conzo on for those of you guys that are um purdue fans for a long long time i think you guys will really really enjoy that conversation so yeah a lot of good stuff coming here um twitter youtube all that stuff so appreciate everybody tuning in Going to be along for the ride for the next, was it five months, hopefully? Um, yeah, we will see you Wednesday after the show.